introduce you briefly because I don't want to take time for from her talk and, and the questions to Joan Rogarden, although I think that she, for most of us in the room, she um, did not need introduction, but she's professor of biology and geophysics emerit at the Standard University. As you have seen, she is now uh, kind of emerita, but is still doing research. And um, she has written many articles and books. Um, I want to mention a couple because actually one of them has been, as we had uh, some Spanish people in the room, um, has been translated to Spanish just a, a month ago. That is the Genial Gene and Evolution's Rainbow. Um, and I want to mention this too, just because it's kind of personal. I, I, it was really great when I crossed over those books and I started to read them and I started to read uh, some of the work that Joan did and is doing because um, it kind of fit with something that oh, I am a bi biologist and certain things that never make that much sense for me when I was a grad student um, and later on working in evolutionary biology. But then it was like, ah, this makes much more sense. <laughs> so thank you, John, for opening that door and, and make us think differently about things that um, has been classically assumed, uh, maybe wrongly assumed as, as a fact. Uh, so in general, she has done research in many, uh, in, in ecology and evolutionary biology, but uh, I think that the most important point here in this conference will be that she has questioned the paradigm of sexual evolution uh, and competition. And yeah, I think that this is directly connected to all the things we are discussing here in this conference. So Joan, please, the stage is yours. I don't want to take more time from your talk and questions. Thank you very much. Well, <laughs> oh, it's great to see the audience. Oh, that's lovely. Well, I thank uh, Soledad de Esteban Travino and the Transmitting Science Organization for the invitation to speak to you at this conference. I'm honored to be with you via Zoom. The first part of this talk reviews some natural variation in gender expression and sexuality that is either not sufficiently known or is problematic for evolutionary theory. And the second part of the talk calls attention to a definition of sexual selection that was developed during a workshop I organized at Nescent in 2013 and contrasts this definition with one recently proposed by David Schuker and Carlotta Carvanamo. Now, this slide illustrates geckos from Pacific Islands that reproduce asexually. Many species of vertebrates, including lizards and fish, reproduce asexually. Asexual reproduction may be obligate or facultative in vertebrates. Facultative asexual reproduction... I found this on the web. <laughs> Excuse me. Facultative asexual reproduction occurs in snakes, monitor lizards, birds, and sharks. Asexual reproduction provides an upper bound to the costs of sex that a species should tolerate. If, for example, if the so-called battle of the sexes becomes sufficiently deleterious, then an evolutionary option, and in some species a behavioral option, is not to bother with sexual reproduction and to reproduce asexually instead. To the contrary, the decision to reproduce sexually is a decision to cooperate, to mix genes rather than to clone. The overar for overarching benefit to sexual reproduction is that the average fitness through time for a sexually reproducing species is higher than that for an asexually reproducing species. Thus, sexual reproduction has evolved over asexual reproduction to realize a higher long-term fitness in a fluctuating environment. There is no reason to accept the hypothesis that sex evolved to eliminate bad genes from the gene pool. Sex starts 
with cooperation. Now this, this slide shows a human egg with human sperm, illustrating the size difference between these two types of gametes. The biological definition of male and female applies to all living things from seaweeds to sea lions. Namely, a male is an individual that makes solely sperm throughout its life. A female is an individual that makes solely eggs throughout its life. And a hermaphrodite is an individual that makes both eggs and sperm during its life either at the same time or at different times. By definition, the sperm is the smaller gamete and the egg is the larger gamete. Therefore, the origin of the distinction between male and female rests with the origin of a size difference between gametes called anisogamy. Anisogamy evolves as a strategy to increase fertilization rates. That is, more gametic contacts and fertilizations occur in seawater when a cloud of large gametes is intersected by a cloud of small gametes than by two clouds of medium-sized gametes intersecting each other. There is no reason to accept the hypothesis of some biologists that, quote, males are dependent on females and propagate at their expense as in a parasite host relationship, unquote. And that, quote, primordial sexual conflict concerned the origin of anisogamy itself, unquote. The origin of male and female does not represent a battle of the gametes. Now, given the origin of anisogamy, the next conceptual issue is how those gametes are packaged into bodies. Both eggs and sperm together in one body type, called hermaphrodism, or eggs in one body, body type and sperm into another body type, called diesi. A simultaneous hermaphrodite produces both sperm and eggs at the same time. A sequential hermaphrodite produces eggs and sperms and sperm at different times. And sequential hermaphrodites come in two varieties, male first, then female, and female first, then male. Now sequential hermaphrodites change sex during life. That means, by definition, they transition from making sperm to making eggs, or vice versa. Furthermore, some fish multiply switch. For example, changing from juvenile to male to female, and then back to male, and changing the size of the gametes they make each time they switch. Now, most plants are hermaphroditic. Only about 6% of plant species have separate sexes. Conversely, most animals have separate sexes, and only 6% of all animal species are hermaphroditic. In this slide, on the left are blue-headed wrasses, a species with some individuals who change from female to male. In the middle are clownfish, a species with some individuals who change from male to female. And on the right are hamlets, a species with individuals who are simultaneously male and female. Now, hermit, hamlets do not self-fertilize. The figure depicts the mating dance, wherein one fish releases eggs and the other releases sperm, and then they turn over and reverse roles. Hermaphrodism is the primitive condition, and diese is derived although in some lineages and some ecological conditions, Daishi reverts back to hermaphrodism. Generally speaking, the advantage to evolving from having both eggs and sperm in the same body to having specialized carriers of sperm and eggs is efficiency in locating partners. Now in fish, Parental care is usually provided by males. 
On the bottom is a pipefish from a group whose tubular bodies resemble a flute. In pipefish, the males glue the fertilized eggs to their bellies while they swim about. Seahorses are derived from, from pipefish. In seahorses, the males have a skin flap on their bellies into which the females deposit their eggs, causing the male to become, so to speak, pregnant. As a result, females in some seahorse species can produce eggs faster than males can give birth to the eggs they are incubating. Hence, females can mate with more males than males can mate with females, so that the males become choosy and the females promiscuous. And this is called sex role reversal. Now, sex role reversal is theoretically important because it demonstrates there is no connection between gamete size and sex role. A common narrative from a branch of evolutionary theory called sexual selection is that, with rare exceptions, males are, quote, passionate and females, quote, coy, to use Darwin's unfortunate terms. Sexual selection theory posits that males with their cheap sperm can afford to play around, whereas females with their expensive eggs stand to lose their reproductive investment if they mate with a genetically infer inferior male. Sex role reversed species demonstrate that either sex can be promiscuous or choosy regardless of gamete size, thereby invalidating sexual selection's claims of a necessary connection between gamete size and sex role. Now, can animals have gender, or is gender reserved for humans? I take gender to mean the morphology, behavior, and life history of a sexed body. A quote, sexed body is a body classified with respect to the size of the gametes produced. Now, for species in which most males have certain traits and most females have other traits, a few males may also be found to have female traits and a few females to have male traits. This situation allows for what has been termed transgender animals. The best studied example occurs in the sun angel hummingbird species from the Andes. Male sun angel hummingbirds have colorful feathers on their throats called a gorget, as illustrated in the slide. A female with a gorget is referred to as a masculine female. It also has a comparatively shorter bill. Conversely, feminine males also exist with a longer bill. Now, males use their gorgets in territory defense of the common short flowers that fit short bills. Masculine females, like the males, can defend territories of short flowers. Conversely, feminine males have longer bills than masculine males. Feminine males use different flowers from the masculine males, namely relatively rare long tubular flowers that do not need to be defended. What is theoretically important is that gender expression indicates occupation, and transgender birds are those whose occupation crosses over into the occupation typical of the other gender. Now this slide, which I took in 2018 during a safari to South Africa, illustrates two male elephants mating. Charismatic megavertebrates often feature same-sex mating, as do over 100 bird species. Now this slide shows male-male mating in rams and lions. The sequence in the top right was given to me by a Brazilian photojournalist. 
they show one male lion soliciting a mating from another male and then proceeding to a male-male mating, which occurs right here. I hope you can see the cursor. The bottom two photos show that same-sex mating in lions occurs in the presence of a female. Now, bonobos are our closest living primate relatives, as shown in the primate family tree at the lower left. The top slide illustrates, oh, uh, should have said, that in August 2021, I visited the Appenhall Zoo in Holland to photograph bonobos. The top slide shows the bonobo habitat at the zoo. The bonobos spend their night in the structure at the top left. Each morning, the zookeeper in the center bottom distributes food. Then the bonobos ex exit their structure to forage for food as shown in the lower right. The top left shows the clitoris of a subadult bonobo. The placement of the clitoris facilitates a form of same-sex mating called GG rubbing, or genital-to-genital -genital rubbing, where the females rub their clitorises with each other, leading to an orgasm accompanied with squeals of pleasure. To alleviate conflict over food scattered across the habitat, the females carry out lots of same-sex mating in various positions. The top right is face-to-face -face lying down. The bottom left is face-to-face -face sitting up. The bottom right is back-to-back. -back. And the top left and center illustrates still more female-female mating positions, back-to-front and genital touching. Female bonobos could write their own Kama Sutra. Unless one think bonobo behavior is irrelevant to the human experience, the diagram at the top right is the primate family tree extending to humans. Bonobos, along with the common chimp, are our closest living primate relatives. The bottom left is a 1974 specimen of Australopithecus afarensis, known as Lucy. Notice that the head size and height agree with the bonobo, but Lucy is more bipedal. And the lower right shows a homonym family tree, illustrating how the genus Australopithecus gave rise to the modern genus Homo. There is speculation in the literature that the placement of the human clitoris might reflect its evolutionarily prior use in female-female mating, a morphological configuration that I term the mark of Sappho. Now, the widespread occurrence of same-sex mating in animals is no longer news to biologists. But what to make of it is not so clear. In my view, same-sex mating belongs, belongs with many forms of affiliative behavior, including mu mutual grooming in mammals, mutual preening in birds, and excess heterosexual mating, as shown in the slide. These behaviors lead to the mutual exchange of physical pleasure. Making a big deal about same-sex mating reflects Western culture's fetishizing of sex. The theoretical interest lies with the entire class of mutual affiliative behaviors, not solely same-sex mating. And I have proposed that affiliative behaviors generally underwrite cooperation. Carrying out cooperation requires coordination of activity, and the act of cooperation itself might be pleasurable. 
how to interpret affiliative behavior and mating behavior in general brings us to the topic of sexual selection. Now, sexual selection theory is widely known in connection with the peacock's tail. These are supposed to result from peahens selecting mates with gaudy tails that signify genetic quality. In 2006, in a science article with Errol Ache and Miko Oishi, as well as in later publications, I have argued that sexual selection theory should be completely abandoned as an explanatory framework in evolutionary biology. My view is illustrated at the top of the slide, wherein what was originally a possibly useful hypothesis to explain the evolution of male ornaments, such as the peacock's tail, has morphed over the years into a, bloatable, a bloated and unfalsifi unfalsifiable doctrine of natural conflict, deceit, and sex stereotypes. Today's sexual selection doctrine is as useless to scientific progress as a three pound, $5,000 Swiss army knife is to carpentry. To develop a constructive way forward, in 2013, I organized a workshop, a workshop with 34 participants at Nescent in Durham, North Carolina to assess the state of sexual selection studies and to suggest future directions. A miniature of the workshop's report is in the bottom left slide. The remarkable finding from the participants, the remarkable finding was that the participants could not agree on the definition of sexual selection. And therefore, a subcommittee of participants worked to develop a definition as discussed later. Then last year, David Schuker and Carlotta Cavarnamo reviewed the definition of sexual selection for the journal Behavioral Ecology. Now their article confirms the nascent finding that no generally accepted definition of sexual selection actually exists. The miniature on the bottom right of the slide presents a full page from the Schuker and Kavarnamo article that was typeset in fine print. The full page was typeset in fine print and shows the many definitions of sexual selection presently in use. And Schuker and Kavarnamo presented their own definition, which I will now contrast with the Nescent definition. Now Schuker and Kavarnamo write, our main aim in writing this paper is to allow the next generation of sexual selection researchers to address the many questions still left unanswered without the baggage of the definition of sexual selection left lying around." Unquote. Well, I agree with this aspiration and thank David Schuker and Carlotta Cavarnamo for their constructive contribution. The Nescent definition and the Schuker and Cavarno definition, which I'll now abbreviate as the SK definition, agree on two main points. First, the long-standing association of sexual selection with sex roles and ornaments, including a relation, a relation of gamete size to sex role, is discredited and jettisoned once and for all. Both definitions, that is the Nescent definition and the SK definition, are sex neutral. This is huge. Second, the definitions agree that a distinction is needed between sexual selection and the fertility component of natural selection. That's the fertility component as distinct from the survivorship component of natural selection. The nascent and SK definitions do not formulate this distinction in exactly the same terms, but the intent seems similar. The nascent report explains the distinction this way. This is the Nesson report. If a female chooses one male over another because of his color without any impact on egg production, then sexual selection occurs. Alternatively, suppose the number of eggs 
a female lays depends on the resources provided by a male. Then if the female chooses one male over another because of the quantity of resources he supplies, then both fertility selection and sexual selection occur together. Both male and female prosper from the increased egg production and additionally the male prospers because of being selected over males supplying fewer resources. And both Nessent and SK call for new statistical methods to partition data on courtship behavior into its fertility and sexual selection components. Furthermore, both definitions, with both definitions, sexual selection is restored to its status as a specific hypothesis for how selection se selects, or for how selection shapes mating behavior rather than as a far-reaching doctrine about sexual reproduction generally. The Nessent and SK definitions do have points of disagreement, however. First, the Nessent definition sees mating as serving both, both social and reproductive roles, whereas the SK definition sees mating as a vehicle for access to gametes. Second, the Nessent definition sees selection as increasing fertilizations via negotiated and coordinated cooperation. This is illustrated in photos of biparental care in albatrosses and penguins that I took near Antarctica in, in 2019. In contrast, the SK definition sees selection as winning at competition for mates. Both definitions define evolutionary success as an increase of genes in the gene pool, but differ on the behavioral mechanisms to attain that increase. I think it's a mistake for SK to stipulate the word competition in their definition. The definition should be neutral about competition and cooperation. Because the definition, the nascent definition is neutral, about the behavioral mechanism, mechanism underlying sexual selection, and the SK definition is not, the nascent definition should be preferred. To stipulate competition as the mechanism of sexual selection, as SK have done, invites two rhetorical traps. First is the need to view cooperation as really competition in disguise, for example, by claiming that two males are, quote, really just competing when offering different degrees of cooperation to a female. This privileges, this phrasing privileges competition over cooperation. Second is the need to specify an object of competition, which SK do with the distinction between gametes and resources as objects of competition. More generally, Courtship behavior is not about competition for objects. It is a system for offering bids in exchange for fitness, as the next slide illustrates. The Nessent report illustrates how to test whether behavior is cooperative or, com or competitive in the context of models for specific situations. For example, consider a male who allocates time into helping a female produce eggs versus guarding. And consider a female who allocates time into foraging versus being available for mating. The reproductive pie, so-called pie, is the clutch of eggs. Fecundity selection on the male favors increasing the size of the pie by helping the female. Sexual selection on the male increases, favors increasing the fraction of that pie that he sires. The slide illustrates the male and female fitnesses resulting from all their possible time allocations. The right edge of the envelope shows the boundary along which no win-win solutions are possible. Along the boundary, or not, not anything beyond the boundary would be an increase in the win-win, would be a win-win solution. So along the boundary, that's all the win-win in 
all the when all the solutions and so any point along that boundary involves giving up something for something else the right edge of the envelope shows the boundary along which no win-win solutions are possible but instead increasing the fitness of the male reduces that of the female and vice and vice versa the best compromise of time allocations is at the green dot which is on that boundary. The non-cooperative time allocations are at the red dot at the bottom. The threat of realizing the red dot motivates the male and the female to find time allocations that attain the green dot. During the courtship, the male and the female communicate their preferred time allocations and either adjust their time allocations accordingly or find partners that do. If a model like this for a specific situation is made quantitative, then the predicted time allocations can be compared with the observed allocations, thereby testing for the existence of a cooperative versus a competitive breeding arrangement. Furthermore, the exchange of physical pleasure provides a way to communicate desired time allocations during courtship and to maintain or adjust those allocations afterwards. Thus, if a male and female are playing competitively with each other, their time allocations should match the red dot and no affiliative interaction should occur. Conversely, if they are playing cooperatively, their allocation should match the green dot and the cooperating pair should participate in continual affiliative interactions that impart a mutual exchange of pleasure to maintain the coordination needed for successful cooperation. Now, most birds are socially monogamous, perhaps as high as 95%, many of which provide biparental care to their chicks. Hence, I predict that courtship in birds is mostly about cooperation rather than competition. Many of my thoughts in this seminar trace to my book, Evolution's Rainbow, published 18 years ago in 2004. The book has sold well and has been translated into Korean, Portuguese, and Spanish. My sequel, The Genial Gene, was published five years later in 2009 and is also avail available in French. I have published numerous articles on gender and sexuality up until 2017 but at that time I felt I had done all that I could on the topic and decided to move on. For the last five years, my research has been on mathematical models for the evolution of the relationship between microbiomes and their hosts called holobionts. All in all, the future for sexual selection studies looks promising now that the basic issue of sexual selection's definition is finally being seriously considered. This will lead to more testable hypotheses and more convincing science. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you very much, Johan. Um, amazing talk. Um, has been really nice to hear it. And let's see if we have, we have a few minutes for questions. Let me check if there is any question online. So I, I have a question. Um, I wonder whether you just say that, I mean, obviously you have pave the path, but um, I'm still a struggle when I talk with my biologist colleague, with many of them, uh, to explain this, and, and it's so rude. I mean, I was taught that at the degree, but they are still teaching it, uh, like yeah, sexual yeah. selection, you know, and everything is competition. Um, so when do you think, you know, how long is going to take to change that? 
if you have any thoughts or idea on it. Um, no, uh, I honestly know that it won't be in my lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, you see the, the sexual selection narrative and also the selfish gene narrative, these, these are narratives that people want to hear. And, um, and it's almost, they have a life of their own, irrespective of the facts. And, and so, the, uh, until the, um, until the appeal of those narratives is, is addressed, we're not going to get the science moving. Um, and as you know, many, many feminist writers have, have written about um, the, the role of power. And the, 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 the selfish gene narrative and the sexual selection narrative um, provide power to people, to, to, the, to their proponents. And they're not about to give that up. And um, the selfish gene narrative, as I've said, uh, is, is basically a nar narrative of gen genetic entitlement. It's a genetic cl uh, classism. And the sexual selection narrative is again a, no a narrative of entitlement that the best male um, deservedly gets the biggest harem and things like that. And and the expansion of the sexual selection narrative into uh, a doctrine of deceit and um, uh, conflict, again, satisfies a need of people to hear that narrative. So my answer to you is that we have to see who benefits from the existing narrative, narratives here, and then address that and then the science will follow. Um, but I think it's going to be a long slog just to uh, attack the existing dogma solely with data and experiments and models. Yeah. There was, I think it's one of the things has been addressed or are being addressed during the conferences. These conferences, yeah, how much time is going to take to change the, yeah, the top and have more diversity so we can have more diversity of thoughts too and not just um, one paradigm that cannot uh, doesn't agree actually with facts um, but yeah I have colleagues that are evolutionary anthropologists working on human evolution oh yeah <laughs> they just keep the yeah, discourse of sexual evolution <laughs> like a yeah, degree the, the, the evolutionary anthropologists the evolutionary psychologists are among the worst and uh they have no respect for data, uh, for, for actual testing. And the, the thing is, they're not really using the scientific method. They're not actually setting out alternative hypotheses. They set out variants of a sexual selection hypothesis and then see which variant may be correct. And, um, but, but you need to find an evolutionary psychologist or an evolutionary anthropologist who actually thinks, is willing to seriously entertain the idea that it's wrong and then design and experiment and set up a situation in which uh, you have a clear sexual selection prediction and a clear um, alternative prediction. And, um, and they don't do that. Uh, and I don't see how uh, that's gonna change because uh, the market is for people um, uh, perpetuating the sexual selection narrative. And, and until, until psychology departments and anthropology departments start hiring people who are who are critics of the dominant uh, uh, narratives um, it's going to stay that way there's there's got to be um, a reward uh, um, in in the academy for uh, uh, challenging the dominant narratives and this this is it is found to some extent in the humanities but less so in the sciences and social sciences. Yeah, we have a question in the chat from Nick. Um, 
I'm going to read it out. Thanks for the talk. I have a question. The narrative of sexual competition, but also the comparison of animal with human behavior is often used to catch people attention during science dissemination event. For example, oh, the female animal of a species X is acting like a woman, being shy and pretending the male to bring her presence, etc. What are the most common errors made on this issue? How can we avoid and expose them? Um, you can you can see in the I think that you can see in the chat the full question too, just in, in the bar zoom bar. Hmm. Oh, it's up yeah, here. it's online. Yeah, yeah, I'm just trying to find in the is in the Q and A. Not in the chat. Not in Q and A, but in the chat. Um, oh, there's like yeah, another one. Yeah. Yeah, you I should have that. like a small red one. Yeah, yeah, I found it now. Science dissemination. I guess that for what what yeah. he means is that for outreach, sometimes like um, like in a way perpetuating a stereotypes. Um, I well, think. the 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 most. Uh, uh, I mean, certainly the most common error is to make a direct analogy between uh, animals and people. Um, and the whole purpose of showing the diversity is really to widen um, the, the, the playing field of possibilities. But I, uh, we, we are not like bonobos, for example, but certainly bonobo but we are descended uh, not from bonobos directly, but from a common ancestor with bonobos. And so it's highly likely that some of the behavior that bonobos have, we, we have too, because we share the uh, ancestor in common. And so one of the most important things to do is, is to draw the analogies with animals with great care and respect the different ecologies um, involved. Um, and the other issue is, of course, not oversimplifying animals it, it, because it's not all competition. There's a certain f facileness with which people turn to animals and uh, they say, oh, well, look, they're, uh, they're competing or they're uh, or one of them is trying to fool the other, so on. And, and then there's this kind of anthropomorphic projection onto the animals, which is then retrieved from the animals as though that's nature's way. And it's a, a circular process. Uh, and, and that's another thing to really watch out for, um, is the, the, the projection of human motivations on the animals and then extracting them from the animals as though that's what's actually going on and being and then used as a naturalistic justification or explanation at least of human conduct um so there there, there are the real real big ones in my view the uh the projection and the uh, and this and the extraction thank you um, yeah, I okay, can see a, I see there's a, another uh, question. Yeah, I can, I can now see these <laughs> coming up. Yeah, Jackie has another question. Let's say I'm really interested in John's comment about challenging the dominant narratives, how this is achieved in the humanities, but less so in the natural sciences. How does she think this can change? Do we, for example, need more interdisciplinary teams or hybrid academics? Disclaimer. I am a STEM grad working in social sciences, but will building bridges across disciplines. Well, yeah, I do think uh, more interdisciplinary uh, work would help a lot. Uh, and um, I think, for example, that uh, that there should, I, I don't know if this would ever be possible, but at least among, uh, uh, in, a, in a graduate core course, let's say, uh, in the sciences, social sciences, there should be an element on feminist theory. 
and critical thinking. Um, and scientists are generally not trained in that. And uh, there should be a, a, uh, some instruction about the importance of location. You know, wh where, where is a speaker or writer's location? And, uh, and a lot of humanist writers uh, handle this uh, and, and the implicit and bias, bias caused by their location by just simply being upfront about their location. Like, um, you know, I'm from a certain country or I'm from, from a certain background or I have a certain experience and this, this is where I'm coming from. But scientists uh, operate under the myth, of course, that, that their location doesn't matter and that it's all facts and theories and tests and experiments. And I've pointed out many times that, uh, that your location influences the kind of hypotheses that you formulate in the first place and also the kind of narratives that you develop to explain what you see. And um, most scientists uh, rebel against the, uh, the idea that, that their location matters. Uh, I actually remember having an argument about this with Richard Dawkins, of all people, once. Uh, and, um, and he got him actually to agree that uh, the diversity of hypotheses uh, generating that the scientific method relies on a diversity of hypotheses because that's what you're supposed to test and and if your hypotheses don't span the set of possibilities then the scientific method can't work and and then uh, if it's if it's also true it's demonstrably true that people from different locations actually propose different kinds of hypotheses and different ways of seeing uh, a situation then that's what's going to improve the scientific method and so there has to be a justification uh, for the diversity uh, that, uh, that a scientist can sign on to. They can say, well, I, I'm really not interested in the ethics or the moral justification for diversity. That's, they might say, well, that's something that's extra scientific, that, that you can go to church and you can go to a, a, some kind of ethical society and, and deal with that, but that's not proper or uh, part, part and parcel of the science itself. But if you make a, a case that the diversity actually matters to the conduct of the science, then you've got them. And, uh, and so that's, that's, I think, what you need to bring the kind of uh, diversity uh, of opinion, which um, is, I say now, more, which, which I believe is standard practice in the humanities where you identify your location and then you indicate what your point of view is and how that differs from somebody else's point of view. So is there any other question? No? Yeah, one has come up here. Oh yeah, it is, it is Jackie saying thank you. And I, I'm not sure it's in Q&A, no, nothing in Q&A. Oh yeah, Josephine, sorry. Uh, Josephine Munch sent another question coming from humanities. This idea of science itself that Joan mentioned is strange. They have the impression that there is a stricken lack of historical self-awareness in some fields of biology and STEM more generally. Is there normally not a component of critical history of science in undergrad courses, for example? Oh, correct. It's not. Uh, th there isn't a. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware of uh, a undergraduate courses teaching a critical history of science. Um, that would, if anything, be a, a, a specialized graduate offering and probably offered out of a history department. And a student would have to be really quite motivated to go out of the science department and and receive that kind of instruction. Um, uh, the, uh, the only role of history in most science curricula is, a, a celebra is to celebrate uh, the people who made uh, the discoveries in the dominant paradigm. So there's a lot of attention to Darwin and, and a lot of fetishizing really of Darwin and, and uh, and a little bit of uh, recognition of Wallace's contribution, and then, so so you just find find the 
the great white male masters uh, being taught in science courses. You don't find any critical uh, historical analysis and nor any um, and so even when Darwin's taught uh, it's that he rose above the religious doctrines of the day and and uh, looked at looked at the actual evidence and came up with the theory of evolution along with Wallace uh, but actually the Wallace Darwin conflict or um, I didn't say conflict, but contrast is interesting because you have Darwin, who's very upper class, and Wallace, who isn't. And, uh, and that, has, that influenced uh, the effectiveness with which the ideas of both were, were received. Uh, Darwin, uh, Wallace was quite critical of sexual selection. And, um, and Wallace also had a very good sense of biogeography. He, he was active in the Indonesian area. So, so I'm, I'm not aware of, uh, of courses that would draw out uh, a critical history of science in an undergraduate course. I don't think that exists. I have to say that we have, or I had uh, in first, my first year, at we had a history of science that was like that. It's just more like a list of people, men, of course. Um, but there is not nothing that make you think about the social context and and how biased we are because we are in a society. It would be nice to have history of science of different cultures and I don't know India, China, whatever, and then you can kind of realize that no. No, so we need more social science in science. <laughs> that's clear, and that's why we are here too. Is there any other question, comment you want to make? So um, we are at the end of uh, our time too. Thank you very much again, <clears throat> Johan, and thank you all for being here and your comments and questions. Uh, we are going to move forward because in five minutes uh, the, the symposiums start. Uh, so thank you, Johan, we will be in touch and thank you for, the, for your time. All right, you bet. Take care. <laughs>